what kind of advice would you have for people about um, training this uh, capability? We've talked about mindfulness a bit, and are there any others? And Well, one of the other uh, important learnings for me in doing the book was the new science of uh, of learning to retrain an attentional habit and thereby re-sculpt the brain. The, the work of uh, people in contemplative neuroscience where they're brain imaging people while they do a, a basic meditation uh, or a range of meditations is, is really impressive. One of the pieces of research that stuck with me was by uh, Wendy Hassenkamp who was at uh, I think she was at Emory. Now she's a research director at Mind and Life Institute. And what they did, uh, she was working with Larry Barcelou at Emory, was look at the basic move in meditation of virtually any kind. doesn't matter if you're doing a visualization or compassion or mindfulness. The basic movement is this. When your mind wanders off, notice that it's wandered, remove it from where it's gotten attached and put it back on your point of focus, whether your point of focus is a, a general mindfulness or a mantra, doesn't matter. The basic repetition is noticing that your mind has wandered, that is, that you've gone th back to the default pattern and habit in attention and bring it back to the chosen new habit of attention. This is why I say uh, for cognitively speaking, all meditations are a retraining of habits of attention. And what they find is that there are different circuitry for each of those four points. There's circuitry for focusing on uh, an attentional stance or an object of attention. There's circuitry for mind wandering. There's circuitry for meta-awareness, noticing that your mind has wandered. There's circuitry for detaching from where your mind has wandered and circuitry for bringing it back. Every time you go through that motion, you're flexing the muscle of attention. The, you're, the, those are the basic repetitions in a mental gym. So what you do is you strengthen that circuitry every time you do that, just like you would with a muscle on a Cybex machine you know, at the gym. And, you're re and so a meditator or someone doing mindfulness is actually changing the shape and function of that person's brain. It's neuroplasticity. And uh, I think that that's, that's very compelling research. It says that uh, what we experience as something very minor, oh, my mind wandered, I'm bringing it back, actually has profound significance for the very wiring of the brain. So, clearly then, meditation practices are a way to entrain uh, attention uh, and um, build these muscles, so to speak, in, in, the, in, in the mental gym. Um, are there other methods that can be helpful as well, since you know, not everybody is going to take up meditation, even though more and more people are? Um, are there some other um, possibilities and gateways? Well, <laughs> you mean for retraining attention? Yeah. Uh, you talked you know, a bit about gaming and... Um, I'm sorry? I, I, Again? I, I, I recall you talked a bit about gaming and, you know, there are some yeah. technological... Well, you know, uh, when I wrote Emotional Intelligence, I became a big advocate of teaching these things to kids in schools. It's become a social-emotional learning, and now it's in tens of thousands of schools. And in the same way, I'm now very enthusiastic about helping kids learn the basics of attention early on and throughout school. It makes so much sense because it helps them pay attention to what they're learning. It's fundamental for education. So there are many, many ways to help kids train attention. Uh, one of them is a little surprising, actually. It has to do with Sesame Street. It's modeling is what it's called technically there. I visited the Sesame Workshop, and the day I was there, all of the script writers were in a meeting with a cognitive scientist. And what I learned 
is that every segment on Sesame Street is a lesson based in cognitive science wrapped in entertainment. So, for example, Cookie Monster uh, is featured in a segment called the Cookie Connoisseur Club, where Alan, who has a shop on Sesame, uh, Sesame Street, uh, forms this club, and people are going to be able to have lots of different kinds of cookies, but they have to be a connoisseur. The first thing you do is you take, uh, you take a cookie and you examine it for imperfections, a little like a wine, you know, wine club. And then uh, you sniff it, and then you take a little nibble and taste it. Cookie, of course, Cookie Monster can't do anything but gobble at first. And Alan says, well, you can't be in the club unless you can learn to restrain yourself. And so he helps Cookie think about it differently. And remember that if he doesn't eat this cookie now, He's going to get lots of different cookies in the future, and that works for him. And for young people, modeling that and understanding that cognitive reframe is the beginning of what's called cognitive control. Cognitive control, which is managing your own impulses, delaying gratification, and keeping your eyes on, on the goal, turns out to be a better predictor of life success, both financially and your health, in your mid-30s than IQ or the wealth of the family you grew up in. It's an independent factor. And so by helping children build these basic attentional skills, we're also giving them a crucial skill for life success. Oh, that's very encouraging that, um, you know, that one can think of many possibilities for uh, training children in attention as this basic skill, uh, some of which would be... Um, uh, mindfulness practice, but others wouldn't look like mindfulness practice at all, so to speak. Well, you mentioned video games, and, and that fits exactly what you're saying. You know, the present generation of video games has a, a mixed uh, effect. It is one way to keep kids focused. They'll look at a video game screen for hours on end if you let them. On the other hand, while it may, and it, that focused attention and those hours of practice do help kids increase their skill at something like vigilance. If they're playing a, uh, a shoot 'em up game, you know, a battle video game, and so many of them are, they also learn a kind of hostility. So when a kid bumps them in the hall, their first thought isn't, well, that was an accident, it's, well, that kid has a grudge against me. So there's a new generation of video games, and Richard Davidson at Wisconsin is one of the people who is uh, designing these games. And the new generation is based on what we're learning about the science of attention. So there's a game called Tenacity, where you tap an iPad screen every time you breathe out. On the fifth breath, you tap it twice. So basically, it's mindfulness of the breath. But it's a video game. And as you get better and better, it gets harder and harder. So it's a video game which is teaching kids how to be mindful, how to pay attention, without going near the word mindfulness and, and, you know, nowhere near the word meditation. But it definitely is the same kind of attentional retraining. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, that brings me to my last question, which is about intelligence. Um, one of the groundbreaking things that you've done is um, to broaden our understanding, I mean, along with many other researchers that you've been reporting on, to broaden our understanding of what it means, what intelligence means. It has many dimensions and is richer than what I was taught as a kid, which was kind of this idea of being a cognitive, analytical superstar. Um, so you talk about emotional intelligence, social intelligence, even ecological intelligence. How does your work on focus um, relate to the, wor the work on, on these dimensions of intelligence? Sure. Well, um, first of all, I got really tired of the word intelligence, so I don't <laughs> use it in this book. But as it turns out, the kind of focus, attention itself, is the foundation of emotional intelligence. In order to be self-aware, in order to empathize, we're really talking about different applications of attention. And then systems awareness, which I 
used as the framework for my a book on ecological intelligence uh, is the third. So in this book, I, I'm really tying all that together and also trying to bring the mindfulness world together with the emotional intelligence universe. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm just curious, um, what were you finding was the limitations of, of, the, of the word intelligence that made you tire of it? Uh, I, I have nothing against the word intelligence. I just felt I, I really am done with it. <laughs> yeah, you did. It, it be, yeah. became like uh, beating a beating a horse at that point. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Dan. This has been really wonderful, and uh, uh, your book is important. And I think, as you've said, it uh, will do for attention what your book on emotional intelligence did for emotional intelligence. Um, um, and it'll be very uh, helpful and inspiring to many people. Well, thanks, Barry. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Bye now. <laughs>